Folks, do you know how close we are to the coming of Jesus Christ? The Bible tells us we don't know the very day or the hour, but we're not children of darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. Praise God. Good morning, Times Square Church. Bless the Lord. If you could go to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to be speaking the fourth part in the series that I've been sharing in this church on finishing the race. I happen to believe that we're coming around the corner of time as it has been known, and the end is in sight. No man knows the day or the hour, as the scripture says, but we do know the season we're living in. It is obvious that Christ is coming soon for his church. I want to talk to you this morning about the real Jesus of the last days. The real Jesus. As you see in the scriptures, there's going to be a lot of Jesuses presented to this generation. There's only one real one. Now, Father, I thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, for the power to speak these words. I thank you for the unction, Lord, to make them live. They've got to live in us, Lord, or it's just another accumulation of knowledge that we will easily discard. Help us, Lord, to embrace these words, to keep them at the forefront of our mind and heart, especially in this day we're living in. Lord, give me the strength that I need to speak this. The clarity of mind, God, the anointing that can only come from heaven. Lord, there has to be a multiplication of your word to make it apply to every mind, every understanding, every situation. And so I trust you to do that today, Lord. Thank you that in all things, Jesus Christ, you will be lifted up and glorified alone. We thank you in your precious name. Amen. The real Jesus of the last days. Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 23. Then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. False Christs, false prophets, great signs and wonders. Remember these words that Jesus spoke. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say to you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now this text tells us that in the last days, in the last of the last days, both calamity on the earth and religious deception will reach epic proportions. There will be famines, there will be pestilences, there will be wars, there will be rumors of wars, there will be even signs in the heavens. All of these things will begin to increase along with a religious deception aimed at the professing church of Jesus Christ. Now Satan has no need to deceive those who already belong to him. The deception is going to be aimed at the church, the professing church of Jesus Christ. The casual believer, uh, the sincere believer, those who attend church every week and those who attend only casually, there's a deception coming. And it's already here, but it's going to intensify in the coming days. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the final and ultimate act of mankind's rebellion against God will be when a satanically indwelt man sits in the temple in Jerusalem. There will, the temple will be rebuilt. Most likely you and I will live to see this. This satanically indwelt man will sit in the temple. He's known as the Antichrist. And he will declare himself to be God. That's the ultimate act of mankind's rebellion against God. That's where it all began. And Remember Satan came into the Garden of Eden and he told Adam and Eve, his own philosophy, his own theology as it is, that God is not the only one that has the words of life. He's not the only one that knows right and wrong. If you partake of what I'm setting before you, your eyes will be opened. You can join me. 
And together we'll be as God. And we will know good and evil. We will, we will be the ones. And what a mess that has brought into the world. As humankind is constantly looking for and declaring and redeclaring that which is right and that which is wrong. Do you notice man left to himself what was wrong a year ago is right today? And what's right today will be wrong next year? And it's always good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Set your watch by it, folks. That's the way it works. When any society falls away from God, that which we knew was evil becomes good. That which we knew was good becomes evil. This time of rebellion is going to be preceded by a falling away, Paul said, of many who had most likely professed or at least had some inclination towards being followers of Jesus Christ. I call it the finish line of a race of deception. The final end of humankind, having embraced the lie. The lie that man needs no redemption. He can be just as God is, declaring things to be what he wants them to be. Chart his own course, finish his own race, and enter into his own imagined glory, which is called hell. His own glory. What a foolish thing humankind is without God. John chapter 6, please, if you go there with me very quickly in your Bibles. I'm going to talk to you about the falling away in our generation, I believe, will look very much like it did in these pages of Scripture. John chapter 6 and verse 53. Now keep in mind, these verses of Scripture come before Christ going to the cross. The society of their day turning into a, 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 a Jesus madness as it is. A madness against everything of God, against that which represents God, against actually God himself. Now these people are about to go into this. They're not aware of it. But Christ is aware of it. Just like you and I in our generation today. I, I, I hate to have to even say these words, but it, it seems to me that there's a revulsion against the things of God. That is seemingly on the increase almost by the hour in our society, in our world today. Now Jesus says to these people, verse 53, Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now what he's telling them is that you don't have in yourselves what it takes to get through. You need forgiveness. And you need to become wholehearted partakers of the life of God that's being made available to you. Christ is saying, through the giving of my body. My body is going to be given for you, and through the sacrifice that that is going to be, there's going to be life given to you. And you're not going to be able to get through without, you have to become a full partaker of that life. There's no half measure of Christianity is going to get through the days ahead of us, folks. And I say it as a shepherd, I say it as a pastor, I say it as a man who, I've, I've, I've got something so burning so deep within me that, the half-hearted are not going to make it. You're, you're going to turn to a false Christ in this last hour of time. And Jesus is saying, you have, to, you have to consume me. You have to trust me for your redemption. You have, to, you have to get into the promises of God that are provided for you. And they, you've got to literally eat this book. It's got to become part of your mind and your thinking, not just your library. Not just an accumulation of knowledge, but, it, but it's got to be knowledge that has transformed you because you and I have embraced it as the ultimate truth in our lives. We won't make it otherwise. I don't care how devout you think you are or how strong you are in your natural mind or body. There's a day of darkness coming and deception that nobody apart from the Christ within us will be able to get us through this. Whoso eats my flesh, verse 54, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. In other words, the life that you will have will not be your own. The strength will not be your own. The direction will not be your own. The vision to get through will not be your own. I will give you these things. That's what the Lord is saying to us. 
But we have to be involved not only in his, the fullness of his redemption, but the fullness of his redemptive work on the earth. We, we can't be just casually coming to the things of God. We, we have to be given to the work of God. And that's always the meeting of human need, the, the reaching out to those that are lost to tell them that there is a God in heaven who loves them. And to be an extended hand of that kindness of God given to us through Jesus Christ. Verse 58 says, This is bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eats of this bread shall live forever. And these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Because you're talking about total surrender here. You're talking about total consumption. You're, you're talking about a total giving of oneself. You're, you're talking about our lives not being our own anymore, but belonging to you, being bought as it is with a price. You're, you're talking about another life goal, another objective to take on the work or the objectives of God and let that flow through us. In this world, this is a hard saying. When Jesus knew in himself that the disciples murmured at it, he said to them, does this offend you? Are you offended because I'm asking you to be my church on the earth? Are you offended because I'm telling you that you don't have the natural strength to get through this? And religion will not give you the strength that you need. It has to be a living relationship with God that is manifested in love of God and the love of your fellow man here on this earth. Does this offend you? He said in verse 62, What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? In other words, you, you might be offended by this, but will it make a difference if you see me raised from the dead? Will it make a difference if... If you see that what I'm asking you to do and what I'm promising you is also given to me of the Father, that you will see with your eyes a dead man raised after three days, will it make a difference? Will you then understand that it, it, it is not a casual encounter or relationship with Christ? Folks, you know what makes this so profound is these people had Jesus speaking to them. Now, I'm speaking on his behalf. I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit is animating the words of my heart and of the text today, but they had the actual physical Son of God, who John says was in the beginning with God, who created all things and was God. They had him actually standing in physical form. They are supposed to be disciples of his. They're supposed to be, these are the sincere as it seems in this generation. Now he's asking them for a complete and total commitment to the cause of God that they're about to see unfolded through his life. Now, many people had come to him, and there are some who could say, well, listen, I didn't come for this. I came because, you know, I was wounded in the past, and I want healing, and I came because I'm hungry, and I see you can multiply bread. I came because I thought we were going to rule and reign. I thought we were going to overthrow the, 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 the Roman Empire, and that's the way it was told me, at least by the person who told me that, who you were. I thought I was going to prosper. And now you're asking me for a full-hearted commitment in this time that we're living in now. He said in verse 63, it's the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they're spirit and they're life. I'm telling you, he said, what I'm telling you is going to give you life. It's going to carry you. It's going to sustain you. It's going to keep you through the difficult days. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, I said unto you that no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. I think it's going to look very much like that in our generation. When the truth of Christ is proclaimed and people say, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up to... To be a declaration of God's life in the midst of a hostile environment and generation. I, I, I came to Christ because I thought it was going to better my life. And now you're, you're, you're intimating at least that the path that you're on, I'm going to be on. The way the world feels about you, they're going to feel about me. The things they say about you, they're going to say about me. And suddenly it's not very attractive anymore. Suddenly it puts everything in its right perspective. He's asking for a commitment that will actually take them to the cross. And yet... 
Many looked and they said, no, we, we didn't come for this. Now, the scripture doesn't say that they abandoned religion, just that they abandoned Jesus Christ. These folks stayed in religion. They went back to the forms of religiousness they knew. They, they might even been more zealous than they were before. But all of it was powerless. They had, they had just been confronted by the mouth of the Christ who created the universe. And they went back. They went back to powerless singing, powerless reading, powerless praying, because they had been confronted with what the, the life of those who follow Christ is supposed to look like. It's, 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 a to, it's a total giving to the work of God, whatever that work is for each individual believer. Paul says in the last days in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, one of the things that will be symptomatic of the society of those days is that people will have a form of godliness but deny the power. There, there, I, think there'll be, I think there'll be the rise of religion everywhere. I think there'll be a feel-good religion that rises. Uh, uh, folks, if you thought you'd seen ec ecumenicism in the past, you've not seen anything yet of what's going to rise. The feel-good religion is going to become the religion of the day. You're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay, we're all in this together, and we're going to save the earth somehow together. But they close the door of their hearts to where the real life and power of God is. They close the door, they have a form, but they really are a denial of what the gospel is all about, of the power of God that transforms people from being selfish to selfless. From being self-focused to other-focused. It's, it's, it's a transformed life. John said in 1 John 2, 18, Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now John, the writer John, the beloved John, who leaned on Jesus' breast at the supper, at the last supper, believed that they were in the last days. And of course we are actually since the day of Pentecost. The Antichrist is a substitutionary Christ who stands in opposition, that's by definition, to who Jesus Christ really is. Now we see this in the book of Exodus. The people wanted to turn back to what they left behind and were delivered from. But in order to do this, they had to create a substitutionary image of God. This is a God who would let them pursue their own desires, seemingly with the same blessing and power in their minds that they had once known. Folks, this is, this is the grave danger of our generation. Paul exhorted the Corinthian church. He said, be careful. Be careful. Be careful who you're following. Be careful what you're believing. Be careful what you're reading. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, as Paul said, if you're not careful, if somebody preaches another Christ, you might very well end up agreeing with it. If I can challenge you as the pastor of this church to do anything, you don't have to believe a word I say. You get in this book and you read it for yourself. You study this thing. You study this book inside out. If you're a new believer, you start in the book of Matthew and you read through to the end. And go back to Matthew and read to the end. And back to Matthew and read to the end. Until this word is inside of you. Until you know you can stand up and say, I know who Jesus is. I know who I have believed. Paul could say that. I know who I have believed. I know. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how many people plead for me to stay in a certain place or to do a certain thing or to not be so extreme or to not go so far or to not follow so sincerely. Paul could say, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that everything I've placed in his hand he's going to bring it right through to the end. I believe it with all my heart. The end time... Strategy of Satan is clear. It's to divert those who are trying to find refuge in calamitous times by presenting a myriad of false Christ options along the way. Many people are going to be trying to find refuge in the kingdom of God. Many who have sat casually in the kingdom of God. Many have just hung on the exterior of the kingdom of God. Some who have been marginally sincere in the kingdom of God are going to start rushing in, looking as it is for the ark of safety. And there'll be signs everywhere. Jesus this way. Jesus is this way. Jesus is over here. Jesus is over there. You ask me, then how can I be sure that I'm following the real Jesus? Well, Jesus said these words in Matthew 24, 26. If they say to you, behold, he's over in the desert, don't go there. 
Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Don't believe it. You see, the devil is not omnipresent. Omnipresent means everywhere, all the time. Jesus is the only one who's omnipresent. You don't have to go anywhere to find him. He is right where you are. Hallelujah. If they tell you he's in North Carolina, he's down in Florida, he's over in Canada, he's off in England, save yourself the plane ticket. He's on the subway with you. Hallelujah. As you and I follow him in his work, on earth he promises to be our strength and our guide. Let me read to you these words. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry? You bring the poor that are cast out to your house. When you see the naked, you cover him. And do you do not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then, he says, your light will break forth as the morning. Remember, he said, as lightning comes from the east unto the west, that's how the Son of Man comes. Sudden light. Your health shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your reward. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he'll say, Here I am, if you take away the midst of you, the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and empty talk. And if you draw out your soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light will rise in obscurity, and even your darkness will be like the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your soul in drought, and make fat your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. He is everywhere. He is everywhere. And when we are found doing His work, all we have to, when we are found doing his work. All we have to do is say, Jesus, where are you? And you say, I'm right here. I've never gone anywhere. I've been where I always am. I'm everywhere. You can't push me out of any room. Jesus can't be pushed out of any place. No matter how dark or dank or hard or difficult your situation is. You're, when you're in the, your office, he is there. When you're at home, he's there. When you're on the subway, he's there. When you're on the street, he's there. He's everywhere you are. He's as close as the mention of his name. When you call out to him in times of fear and confusion, he will respond with fierceness and power and scatter your enemies. David said in Psalm 18, you remember, David said, darkness was all around. I was afraid on every side. Enemies seemed to be everywhere. I was in danger of being overwhelmed. And of course, he's speaking about the fear of the moment. Society seemed to be completely against the anointing of God that was upon his life. He's being pursued, as he said, like a partridge in the mountains. A man who knew that the touch of God had been on his life. But he said, when I cried to you, you heard me. Now, he wasn't in a temple when he cried. He wasn't in a church service. He was in a cave. And he said, when I cried to you, you heard me. And he said, not only did you hear me, but you stood up and you were wroth and smoke went out of your nostrils. Now, that's a vivid picture. David saw this. He's writing on the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this has to be an accurate portrayal when the devil starts messing around with a true child of God. You rode on the wings of the wind. And he said, yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Remember what Jesus said. As the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In our darkest times, he will bring light. When our enemies seem to be triumphing over us, he will scatter them. And then lastly, for as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He says, I will come for you soon and suddenly. Soon and suddenly Christ is coming for his church. Folks, don't give up now. 
Don't quit the race now. Don't look for another Jesus now. We've come too far by faith. You've heard so many messages about how difficult it's going to be. And I don't know if we can, any of us can adequately describe it. There'll even be a season, according to Paul, where they say peace in the Middle East and safety. Maybe this upheaval that's happening will take a turn for the good. Maybe it will look like peace is finally coming to the earth. But it says when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Sudden, out of not seen, not prepared for. Prophet Isaiah says in one hour, everything changes. Everything changes in an hour. And folks, we're living in that kind of a time. But for you and I, it's not an hour in which everything will change. It'll be in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be working in the field. I had a dream about this one time. Now, it's only a dream. That's all it was. But I was working in the field with my wife, Teresa, and another person we knew. And, and suddenly, we were just out with we had rakes and hoes, and we're out in a field. And suddenly, we started lifting from the earth. And we were going up into the air. And I remember this other lady who was a friend of ours was saying, It's the rapture. It's the rapture of the church. It's the rapture of the church. And I looked over at my wife. Her hands and feet were going in the air, and she was shouting, Hallelujah! 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 And me, being ever the realist, I looked down and I said, I sure hope you're both right. <laughs> because if you're not right, we're in real trouble because at this point we're about three, four hundred feet up in the air. <laughs> it's going to happen one day, soon and suddenly, soon and suddenly. The Lord Jesus is going to come with a trumpet and a shout. The father's, going to, the father's going to lean over to the son. And time, I guess, as we know it, is going to be very close to an end. And he's going to say, son, go get your bride. Just like a, a man who just has loved this girl for so long and has been betrothed and just can't wait. And think on his case, it's been over 2,000 years. And he just said, go get your bride. The ones that are, have already died, the ones that are still alive. And the scripture says he comes with a shout, hallelujah to the Lamb of God, like lightning from the powerfully, quickly. That's why you don't have to go to the desert. You don't have to go to the clock. Don't believe anybody that says, because he says, no, I'm, when I come for you, everybody's going to know it. The whole world is going to know it when I come for you. It's going to be like lightning from the east to the west. Nobody's going to miss this. Nobody's going to be left out. The dead are going to raise first out of the ground, and we who are alive and remain will be gathered together with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the, the scripture says he comes with a shout. I love that. My church, my bride, hallelujah. I think in that shout, every name that's ever been given to him is named. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a compilation of your name and my name. Everyone has ever trusted, everyone who's not given up, everyone who's been partakers of the sacrifice that he made on the cross that we might have life. Everyone who's trusted him for life and strength and breath and against every enemy and to be able to go through all opposition and to be a testimony of Christ no matter how dark it gets in the world. Everyone who's believed that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everyone who's embraced in their heart that no weapon formed against me can prosper. And every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I have a righteousness that's not my own. It was given to me of God. I have a covering that's not my own. I have a future that's not my own. I have a pathway that's not my own. I have a life that's not my own. It belongs to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't have a dowry. As part of the bride of Jesus Christ, you and I have nothing we can bring to him. But what I do have is a heart that's filled with his word. A heart that's longing for his coming. A heart that's longing to see his work done in the earth. A heart that's longing to see prison doors open. To see blinded eyes seeing again. To see deafened ears hearing. To see those that are wounded in heart healed by the power of God. I have a heart. That's what I bring to him. And that's what he's coming for. And that's what the shout is all about. I'll come for you soon and suddenly. So when it gets hard, when it gets difficult, no matter 
what you're in today or going to go through tomorrow, remember that Jesus is coming for you. This life is only a vapor. James said it's just here for a moment. It passes away. In a hundred million thousand billion years from now, you'll be so thankful you didn't give up the race. You'll be so thankful that you didn't divert into some pit stop somewhere or succumb to some voice offering a more comfortable religion. You'll be thank God. You'll be thanking God for eternity that you stayed running with those that have run this race for 2,000 years. You didn't give up. And folks, we're going to have to encourage one another as we come around the corner because a lot of us are not professional runners. And we're going to have to encourage one another. We're just going to have to... You ever, I heard one time that geese, when they're flying south or north, whichever way they go, depending on the time of the year, they, they honk at each other to keep each other moving. Did you know that? Well, that's according to a study I did. They, they said that was one of the reasons. Did you, you saw that? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So we're going to have to honk at each other. I'm not talking about when you get your car out on 51st and stuff. But you're going to have to just say, come on now, get up and keep running. When somebody falls, we're going to have to take him. We're going to have to hold him. Folks, we're going to get across this finish line. We're going to do it together as the body of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to do it together. We're going to walk this walk together as the church of Jesus Christ. And we're not going to give up on the work of God to see the... Re those that have no helper, to see them, the help of God through His church brought to them, whatever form that's going to take. Revelation 3 is my last scripture, please, if you'll turn there. Revelation 3. In the church of Philadelphia. Beginning of verse 7, he says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he that is holy, that is true, that he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength. You've kept my word and you've not denied my name. I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they're Jews and are not, but do lie. I'll make them to come and worship before your feet. To know that I have loved you. He's talking to his church about all of those who have professed to know him. But it's not been in truth. The reason they'll come and worship. Because there'll be such an incredible strength. is not to worship you. He's not saying this to his church. But to worship before your feet. In other words to say. Tell me where have you found this strength? How did you get this strength to get through this time? Because you've kept the word of my patience. I'll keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Let nobody take your crown, because you're already on track for victory. You're already on track to be more than a conqueror. You're already on track to finish the race and to do it lawfully, to do it rightfully, to do it God's way. And at the end of that race, there's a crown. Paul talked about it. A crown of righteousness laid up for all of those that love God and have gone on in the work of God and have not given up when opposition faced you. And this is my altar call this morning. Hold fast that no man take thy crown. I, I want to give an altar call for those who are in danger of giving up. And, and you came here this morning... And a despair was in your soul. And you said, God, if I don't hear from you, I don't know if I can go on. Where am I going to find the strength to face tomorrow? Let alone the pastors of this church are talking about more difficult times coming. Well, if they're any more difficult than what I'm facing today, where will I find the strength to go on? How will I ever get through? How will I ever manage in the days to come? This altar call is for you. That you can simply come forward to the front of this sanctuary or between the screens in the annex and be encouraged. Simply be encouraged. Now, if you've, if you've reached out and laid hold of things you shouldn't have, 
If you are involved in practices you shouldn't be, if you're looking for comfort in places that only captivate, you need to lay these things down. And you need to trust God for the power to do that today. Lay aside the sin that so easily besets you. And let Jesus Christ give you the strength to be his church on the earth. I speak specifically to those who feel like giving up. I'm going to ask for honesty today. As you make that effort to get out of your seat and come forward, I believe that God is going to meet you. I believe that as we worship, he's going to give you strength. He's going to help you. Let's stand to our feet, please. And for those that this is speaking to, just step out, please, in the balcony. You can go to either exit, the main sanctuary. Just slip out wherever you are. Make your way to the front of the sanctuary, please, if you will. And we're going to pray for you. Our prayer today as an entire church body is going to be for you because we're not leaving you behind. Nobody is going to be left behind who wants to walk with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's an eye-opener to us, church, that we're not in this alone. There's other people in this with us, and some are losing heart. And we always have to be aware of that. It's so important that we speak kindly to each other. We become a strength to those that are weary. A good word, the scripture says, spoken in season, how good it is. Let's believe God to give each other strength. One of the things that we need to understand in our time is the spiritual authority that's given to the church of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus said these words, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Everything, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Everything that tries to take away that victory of Christ. And Jesus said, And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now you and I are going to take that position today. We're going to stand just like Moses stood before Pharaoh on behalf of these people that are at this altar. The rest of the church, we're going to pray. Moses stood on behalf of the nation. And Pharaoh said, was trying to make a deal. Okay, right, you and a few others go and leave the weak and leave the old and leave the young. And Moses could stand before Pharaoh and say, no deal whatsoever. We all go. Our young go, our old go. We all go. We have authority in the name of Jesus Christ. And we need to start to pray for one another. And pray that God give that word of encouragement to those that need it today. Because you and I may need it tomorrow. Hallelujah. I want you to raise your hands now, if you will, towards these that are at the front of the sanctuary. And lift your voice now. And we're going to ask God for great grace and great strength. Father, we come before you as the body of Jesus Christ. In Times Square Church, Lord, to lift up these that have gathered at this altar and have gathered in the education annex and stood up and they're in danger of being overcome by their situation. Lord Jesus Christ, we take authority over Satan in your name. We take authority over the works of darkness, over all the lies of the devil, every work of discouragement, everything that tries to take away the completeness of the cross, Every captivity that declares it will never let go. We take authority over these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My God, you are the God who gives strength. You give strength to those that have no might. You increase our strength, God. Your word says you give us wings like eagles to rise up and to begin to fly over all of these circumstances, to climb all of these mountains, to leap over all of these walls, everything of hell, everything that the enemy sends against us. We have the power in our Christ to stand against it and to stand victorious over it. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're going to bring these through. Every last one at this altar is going to make it through, Father. We stand on their behalf. We stand and pray for those who don't even have a voice to pray for themselves. We thank you, God, for victory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for victory. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for victory. Thank you for victory. Thank you for the 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 victory. 
We proclaim that victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every prison door you have to open. Every besetting sin you have to let go. Every blinding thing you have to let their eyes be open. My God, my God, give strength to your people. Give strength to your church. Give strength, oh God, give strength. Let us mount up and run. Let us run, oh God, this race set before us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. It's all in Jesus. Our strength is in Jesus. Our victory is won. The battle is over. It's finished. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We proclaim here this day that nobody at this altar, nobody in the annex who stood today, nobody's going under. Nobody. You have a living Christ. You have a living Christ. You have a living Christ at the right hand of Almighty God. We are more than conquerors through Him that loves us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're not going down. You're going up. Hallelujah. Look at me. You're not going down. You're going up. You're going up. You're going up. You're going up. Any day now, you're going up. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm not leaving you behind. I'm not leaving you behind. We're not leaving you behind. We're going together. We're finishing this race together. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. You're going to make it, man. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. You don't listen to the lies of the devil anymore. Don't listen to that voice anymore. You have someone inside of you who's stronger than anything that hell can ever throw against you. He is stronger. He is stronger. Sin is broken. We have the victory in Jesus. Give him a shout of praise in this house. Hallelujah. 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 We win. We win. Praise God we win. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Let's praise him. The day has come upon you and I. And we're going to simply have to stand with the testimony of God in our heart. The word of God in our mouth, the light of God in our eyes. We're going to stand on behalf of the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible predicts the moral state of mankind at the end of the age. Are we witnessing these very things? said in Matthew 24 verses 4 and 5 that in the last days many would come in his name proclaiming that they were the Christ and would deceive many. As I've traveled around the world in the past several years I've actually encountered people who are following leaders who proclaim that they are the Christ and this is not just happening in one or two countries this is happening worldwide. For example while I was speaking in Moscow an individual jumped up, interrupted the meeting, and said that what I was telling them about the Bible wasn't true, 
that they were following the Messiah, the true Messiah, and what he was telling them was the truth, and that the people should follow that message rather than the Bible. While Christians all over the world prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, some believe he's alive right now. Where? Well, in the deep wilderness of northern Russia. It looks like a scene right out of a Sermon on the Mount. We traveled many kilometers through bug-infested forests to reach this isolated village in Siberia, this most northern part of Russia. Here we meet Jesus, or Vasiryon, as they also call him. But humankind must make a choice. They have to be shown the way, and they must choose to follow or not to follow. That will not make a choice for them. And thousands in this village believe this is Jesus Christ. These are not misfits or lunatics, they were mostly professionals who abandoned lives in Europe to follow the man they call Jesus. We have seen so many people today who are making claims to being the Messiah. And many are being deceived. Jesus said, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise. They'll show great signs and wonders and deceive, if possible, even the elect. There are so many today in the New Age movement who are claiming to be the messiahs or claiming to be channeling the wisdom of the messiahs for these days. It's an amazing thing to me, again, the lies that men will believe once they've rejected the truth. The words of Christ are being fulfilled before our eyes. These are the signs of the last days, according to Jesus. Over the past several decades, I have been following the pattern in society today where people are incredibly interested in the metaphysical, mystical, occultic dimension. And this is something that is literally happening in every nation around the world. Today, throughout the world, the concept is that God is everything because people have embraced an Eastern metaphysical worldview. They're turning to yoga, to meditation, out-of-body experiences, a belief in crystal consciousness. The ideas that we have considered as pagan in the past are being embraced today as the new spirituality and literally being embraced around the world. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says, that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. You know, I've traveled around the world interviewing people uh, who've been on drugs, uh, psychedelics, practicing yoga, under hypnosis. Uh, there are about a couple hundred ways to reach an altered state of consciousness. In a normal state of consciousness, your spirit operates your brain in an altered state. You've loosened that connection, allowing another spirit to interpose itself, tick off the neurons in your brain, creating a, a universe of illusion. It talks about they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. One of the big things today is channeling, communication with spirit beings. Uh, it's in the business world. And as, as I said, I've traveled around the world interviewing people and I can tell you this, there is a commonality of the information that comes to them. They all get the same revelation from these spirit entities. Paul talked about the doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that would be involved in a deception which would also occur in the name of Christianity. He talked about many people that would lead people astray and this was what we see taking place. One of the greatest deceptions that is occurring in our time is happening in the name of Christianity as people are embracing a form of Christianity based on extra-biblical experiences. We see the rise of satanic worship, of the satanic cults. We hear it with the musicians. We see it invading the culture of the youth today and we see the young people doing such horrible things unthinkable things because they are being drawn into these satanic cults 
Why could they be drawn into these things? Because they have been held back from the truth of the gospel. Because their parents haven't shared with them what God's truth is. There is this fascination for the occult because they do not have the truth of God in their heart. Never before have we seen such an explosion of fortune telling, hypnotism, psychics, magicians, and dungeons and dragons and these kinds of things that we see in our world today. Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah ye were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You have to be aware that Satan is coming against this generation in an unprecedented measure. He is attacking this generation to take the thoughts of God out of the minds of an entire society. He's doing it through the school system. He's doing it in our colleges. He's doing it in the marketplace. He's doing it in the halls of government. And he's even doing it in the house of God. Trying to eradicate everything that comes from the mind of God. To blind an entire generation. To take captive as many as he can. For the scripture says he knows that his time is short. That fallen nature that was sown into humankind in the Garden of Eden that which is resonant within you and me all of society every man every woman ever created has this capacity of sin inside that manifests itself through the thought that i can be as god and i can determine in myself what is good and what is evil i don't need god to tell me what the parameters of acceptable behavior are folks I can keep your heart open to the word love the word of god god will establish you when that antichrist spirit comes in like a flood the word of God lifts up a standard against it, cannot make an inroad to you. Now, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 7. I want to share with you a message that's entitled, The Final Pleading of Conscience. Now, I'm going to be reading this chapter and other portions of Proverbs. We're going to be in Proverbs the whole time. In this context, Proverbs chapter 7 speaks about a seduction. And there's two ways you can look at this particular chapter. Because if you look at it in the way that God was giving it to Solomon, who wrote it down, calling him my son. Solomon had a physical weakness for personal pleasure. 
And that was part of the seduction. But the secondary part of that seduction was that with his weakness for personal leisure and pleasure, and you read about that in Ecclesiastes, that definitely was the weakness of his life. It brought with it a spiritual seduction. And I want you to read it with me in that context. When, it, when a people begin to gravitate towards pleasure in, in all of its facets, whether it's just leisure. Remember Solomon just set out to, in Ecclesiastes, he said, I'm, I set out to find what makes men happy, which is ironic because he was given the guardianship of the actual physical presence of God on the earth at that time. The manifested physical presence was in the temple. And he knew everything about that temple, but in his heart, he just, this question, I, I've shared on it before in this church, I said he left the answer to pursue the question. And he left it because of the lust of his own heart. It happens to churches, it happens to cultures, it happens to countries, where we actually have the answer, and we know what the answer is, but because of that, that inherent weakness in the human heart to pursue what we think will make us happy, we leave the answer and we begin to pursue a question. That's what Solomon did. It's what America has done, probably in the last 50 or more years. We've been on a gradual slide, spiritually and morally. And now we're at the time where we're in the final pleading of conscience. And so pray with me that God have his way today and this word be spoken clearly to all of our hearts, mine and yours, and anybody online or live today that's listening to us. Now, Father, I thank you, Lord, with all my heart for the knowledge in our hearts that you are a God of mercy. For if you weren't, we would have no hope now. If you weren't, darkness would swallow us, swallow the nation, swallow our testimony. If you weren't, you wouldn't be the one who said when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against it. And so, Lord, we appeal to your mercy. We see your mercy on the cross. We hear it in your words. We discern it in your character. And God, we appeal to mercy today and we ask you, Lord, to speak to our hearts, each of us, Lord. Speak clearly, powerfully. Give us a sense of our purpose on the earth now, especially now. Help us, Lord, to draw away from what makes us weak and draw towards again the strength that you are willing to give to us. I ask you to overshadow the frailty of this human vessel as I bring forth your word and let your thoughts become mine. Let your heart be mine. Let your voice be mine. I simply offer myself as a vessel in your hand that you can use. Lord, you and I both know that you have to multiply the frailty of this vessel. And so I thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the willingness that you have to one more time breathe on us whether we deserve it or not. Thank you for your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 7, we'll be reading this passage of Scripture in the context of what I have just spoken to you of the proper way to actually see it. My son... Keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now, you remember the history of Solomon is that he made allegiances with foreign nations for his protection the protection of Israel at that time as he saw it. And part of the procedure of making allegiances with foreign kings is they, is they would give you one of the women of their family to marry, to make you blood, a blood relative, technically. But with these women, he thought it was going to bring protection. And, and what it brought him to is a place where not only was he seduced by his own fear and his own lust, but he was seduced by the religious words that these women brought with them. For at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice. Remember, God speaking to Solomon. And saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a man, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path through her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. 
She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square. You might say she was also in Times Square. <laughs> lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. In other words, there's a religion involved with me. May I put it that way? Peace offerings was that which would, you took to God to make wrong, a sense of wrong right. Today I've paid my vows. So I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I've found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored carverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield, and with her flattering lips, she seduced him. He immediately went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver, and as a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Remember the end of Solomon's life. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray in her paths, for she's cast down many wounded. All who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. I want to share with you a parable. I felt the Lord speaking in my heart along the context of this book in Proverbs. It's a parable about a man leaving that which had proven to be the source of his stability and that which history had always recorded would be the sense of life being fulfilled on this earth. God had given him a wife and God had given him children. There's something in the human heart that even though it's what God has provided, it's, it's decreed, it's written, it's established, it has a history, it's known. Even though he knows that this is the route to the blessing of God and the happiness that God provides he allows himself to be seduced by an affair which is causing him to be led by his own carnal senses. This affair is offering him pleasure without responsibility. And isn't that what the predominant theology of America has done for the last 20 years? Offered pleasure, but no responsibility with it. Offered to satisfy the senses, offered to make us everything other than what God says would bring us into a place of fulfillment. Causing him to yield to the delusion that he's leaving hopelessness for delight. When in reality he's leaving what ultimately would bring delight to his soul for hopelessness. At dusk as he prepares to leave everything behind him for good... He stops for just a moment, and I can picture this man in my mind. And he stops outside the doorway of his home to the final pleading of his conscience to turn around. He has charted a course for his future that is going to produce heartache. It's going to produce children with sorrow. It's going to produce a deep abiding sorrow in his own heart. He's going to lose everything. He has no idea that the seduction he's fallen under is after his life. He has no idea. Even though history records that others who have followed in these footsteps have paid a terrible price for it in the long run, he still makes the decision to go in this direction. But there's a moment, and this is what I want to talk about this morning. There's a moment where he stops just for a moment. And if anybody here has ever done something you shouldn't do and you know you shouldn't do it, you know that moment comes. It's a moment. It might be a fleeting moment for others. It might be a more extended moment. But it's, it's a moment where you, you stop and say, should I be doing this? And will it really satisfy me? And what will it produce in the end? And this is where we are as a nation today in America. We're at this moment 
where our conscience, we're at the final pleading of conscience, the last moment where we can turn around. If we wait another five years, it's going to be too late. If we move towards godlessness, the time will pass. Solomon couldn't foresee when he wrote these words what it was going to bring to the nation of Israel. He didn't foresee Rome coming in and ransacking and destroying the temple. Couldn't have heard the screams and cries of what, what he thought and others thought could never be triumphed over. Suffering such indignity, bringing such shame to the name of the God that he purported to serve. He never could have seen it. America is pursuing an illusion. An illusion that we can forsake God, we can cast off the restraints on all of our behaviors, we can pursue our own lusts and still have a utopian end when this is all over. A seductive spirit, verse 14 says, I have peace offerings with me and today I've paid my vows. It's a seductive spirit that promotes the indulgence of self and claims that peace and satisfaction will be the end result, even claims to offer peace with God. I'm telling you, this whole society is sick. As Isaiah once said about his own people Israel, from the top to the bottom, it's sick. And it's sick because we have forsaken a living relationship with God. We have pursued a seductive spirit that has allowed the people of this nation, even in the house of God, to indulge ourselves. When the whole call of the gospel and the cross of Christ is not about ourselves, it's about living for the benefit of others. That is the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says, so I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face and I found you and I spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. It's amazing. The seductive spirit uses an illustration that promotes the attributes of other failed societies, extolling the virtues of the godless while hiding the already revealed bankruptcy of what they once considered strength. It's interesting that this seductive spirit invokes linen from a society that every child of God should have known would lead them back into captivity and subject them to bondage if it could. Come home with me, get in bed with me, the seduction says, and we'll be covered by Egyptian linen. Every child of God should know what Egypt had done. The things of this world and what the world would do and the, it was a grave mistake when the church of Jesus Christ theologically got in bed with the thinking of this world and said to the thinking of this world, cover us, cover us with the same love of gold, cover us with the same lust for power, cover us with the same desire to be socially accepted and to be at the top and not at the bottom. Cover us to be other than what our Christ is and what our Christ told us we would be. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? He also said, woe to them that the world speaks well of. For so did their fathers of the false prophets. Being covered by a society that was once judged by God, its power was drowned in the arrogance of its own pursuits. Verse 18 to 20 says, come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. It's an illusion that our new love of ourselves will delight and satisfy and that somehow we can forget God. He's gone far, far away. His word no longer applies. There's nothing to fear. You don't have to worry about what the red letters in your Bible say anymore. No, we can forget God without any consequence. That's exactly what she was saying. That's what this religious and secular seductive spirit says. Oh, where's the promise of his coming? All things remain as they always have been. Don't worry about him. This is all about us, you and I, just now. Don't worry about him coming back. Put away the day of his return. 
Oh, what a surprise it's going to be, my friend. Because when we don't expect it, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trump of God is going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to be raised. And we, we who are alive and remain, shall be gathered together with them. He had no idea that this seductive spirit was after his life. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver and a bird, as a bird hastens to the snare and he did not know it would cost his life. He didn't know that the seductive spirit was after his future was after his children, was after his family, was after his security, was after his hope, and ultimately was after his relationship with God, was after his influence for good on the earth. He didn't know that that's what this seductive spirit was after. And I gotta tell you folks, we are in a mess. We're in a social, political, economic, and spiritual mess in this nation right now. But as I was praying this morning, oh God, oh God, I was here last night in an empty sanctuary praying, oh God, all that's left in my heart is to appeal to your mercy. Because you're a God of mercy. God is good and his mercy endures forever. I see mercy in the cross. I see mercy all through the scriptures. I see Jonah going to Nineveh who are violent, vile, godless, angry, evil, and you sent one man and brought a whole society into a moment of reprieve. They were eventually judged, but they had a moment of reprieve where men, women, and children were given a chance to turn to God. I see mercy throughout history as I read the testimony after testimony of nations and societies that have fallen into such debauchery. I see England where people are drunk and fornicating in the streets and God sends John Wesley and George Whitfield and raises up a voice one more time in the nation because God is a God of mercy. You ask yourself today, you say, as I do, I can see what's happening, but what can I do? What possible difference can my life make to stop this destructive course that so many seem to be set upon? If we go into the next chapter in Proverbs, it gives us the answer. Does, because the whole chapter of seven is, chapter seven is about the seduction. Chapter eight is about what can be sent to counter the seduction. Does not wisdom cry out, and understanding lift up her voice. Here's what you can do. Cry out, pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Jesus shared a story in Luke chapter 11 about a man who at the midnight hour realized he didn't have enough to give to the need that was around him and had presented itself before him. And so he went to the door of a man who in this parable was already in bed, tucked in with his children. His day was already done. And he started knocking on that door. And even though the man said, I wouldn't get up, it was too late to get up. He said, but for his insistence, for his unwillingness to go away for that cry that was in his voice. I have a friend that's come to my house. I don't have enough to give him, but I know that you have all the bread that I need. I know you have everything. You have the fullness of supply. You have the compassion. You have the courage. You have the power. You have the provision. You have everything I need. And so he cried. And that's why the prayer meeting is so important now. Prayer meeting is not just something we do now on Tuesday night. Again, Proverbs chapter eight, verse two, it says she takes her stand on the top of the high hill bes beside the way where the paths meet. She takes her stand. Proverbs 1, 20 says it this way. Will wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. 
She speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known. It is so important now that you and I stand up. That we begin to pray first, but we take our stand. And we resolve in our heart, you and I, that I'm not going to draw back into silence at this time. I'm going to stand where the paths meet, as it says in Proverbs 1. I'm going to stand in that place where this person, my neighbor, is standing in a place of indecision when this final pang of conscience has come upon him. And I'm going to stand and I'm going to plead. Don't walk in your own knowledge. Don't do things your own way. Don't think it's going to bring you to a desired end. God says that if you will turn to him, he will give you his Holy Spirit. You will be saved. You will be turned into another man, another woman. You'll be given power. You'll be given grace that can't come from any measure of human effort. You'll be made into the person that God destined you to be and you'll be brought to a place where your life will count for his glory. You'll be given a song in your heart that doesn't come from the earth, it comes from heaven. You'll be given light in your eyes that no amount of the lights in Times Square can produce. You'll be given determination, giftings, wisdom, words, abilities that only could come from God. If you will turn to him, he will pour out his spirit upon you. I want to read to you a letter, an email that I received yesterday from a pastor and a pastor's assistant in Paris whose church is on the block where these killings just took place. It's from a young lady called Catrian who's his assistant. Dear pastors Teresa and Carter Conlon, I write on behalf of Pastor Frank Lefiliatre who asked me if I would kindly share the below letter with you and ask if you could read it to your church and ask for your prayers. I would personally add in my own name, but I am sure he would agree that we have not known greater inspiration in prayer life than your church. And we have spent the last two years seeking to grow in prayer as a body, inspired by your testimony. So I believe this request is far beyond the right thing to ask for. We have never felt this need in a more realistic and stronger way. Your prayers are gold to us. This is from the pastor himself. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is to you. Tragically, for the second time in less than a year, Paris has been plunged into bloodshed because of Islamist terrorism. Even though the people remain courageous and united, our whole country is in shock and profoundly scared. Our church finds itself at the very heart of this tragedy. The neighborhood of Bastille, where we have been established for over 40 years, is that where the shootings targeting Charlie Hebdo, the Bataclan, and the restaurants took place. We are especially affected by the tragedy which happened in the Bataclan's concert hall, as it is there so close to our church that we held two conferences with Pastors Carter and Teresa Conlon and Claude Hood in 2014 and with Nikki Cruz this year. Last Friday evening, we were holding a prayers night in our church building. The room was packed. For several weeks now, we have begun feeling a wave of the Spirit rising up. Powerful visitations of God, people giving their lives to God, healings, deliverances at almost every meeting. In the middle of the horror, God is preparing a powerful visitation for this country and we are ready to rise up to the challenge, whatever the price may be. We thank you for your marks of affection and for lifting up France and Paris in your prayers to the Lord. You know, folks, if we ask ourselves a question, is our prayer meeting having any effect? Is there anybody out there listening? from the 161 countries that are becoming part of the worldwide prayer meeting here on Tuesday night. Well, here's an example of people who've been stirred, inspired, strengthened, 
finding themselves in the very middle of hell at this particular moment, but standing up, and I love the words of this pastor, prepared to meet the challenge, whatever the price may be. Prepared to meet the challenge. Pastor Frank, I want to tell you this morning that your words have challenged me. And in prayer, just recently, I've repeated the words of your letter. And I pray God that we are prepared here in New York City to meet the challenge as well, whatever the price may be. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to take a stand. It's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to pray. It's time for us to choose what we're going to follow. Are we going to follow the seductive spirit that just uses God for itself? Or are we going to stand up for people that face the danger in ours and the future generations of heading into eternity without God? into a place called hell and everything that means, which is so staggering our minds can't even begin to comprehend it. I'm simply not willing that they should go there. And it is going to be a cost. We are living in a hostile society to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I understand that. But the scripture says, cry out, lift up your voice, take your stand at the top of the high hill not the bottom. Take your stand in a visible place. Take your stand where it can be seen and it can be heard. Challenge and encourage people to do right. You don't have to be shouting like I am this morning. You can do it in a soft voice. Remember, God brought Elijah out of despair and sent him on the right path with a soft voice. But it's imperative that you and I say something now. And thirdly, Again, in Proverbs 8, 3, and 4, it says, He cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. It's one thing to pray. It's a second thing to stand. But the third part of this is to be a witness of the truth, a physical witness of the truth, a witness of that is not chosen the easy way, but God's way. A witness of the power of God that he's willing to give everyone who turns to him in truth. In other words, it's like saying to somebody, instead of telling you about God, let me show you who God is. Let my life be a demonstration of his love, his compassion, his wisdom, his power. And he's not willing to withhold. That's why he said in Luke 11, I say to you, ask, it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened. Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks shall find. To everyone who knocks, it shall be opened. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? But we have to ask for the right reason. I want your Holy Spirit so that you might be glorified. I want your Holy Spirit, oh God, so that you would give me the ability to turn men and women away from this insane path of self-delusion to the path that leads to the cross, that leads to eternal life. I'm tired of cowardice. I'm, I'm tired of self-focus. I'm, I'm tired of thinking and talking about myself. God, help me to follow the one who said, not my will, but thine be done. Help me, Lord Jesus Christ. Help me to pray. You realize our prayer meeting has strengthened this group of believers in Paris on that street where these killings took place. Some people wonder, is anything happening? That's only one. People are wanting to pray. They're, they're wanting to gather. Take a stand. And be a living witness. Just a living witness of who God is. Because all else is going to fail. 
Everything else is a delusion. We're all on borrowed time now, folks. But we have a moment of conscience. I don't know how else I can say this, but I plead with anybody who can hear. We have a moment of conscience. Fairly soon, the conscience of this nation will be seared. But we're living in just a moment when people are saying, what's happening to our children? Why the violence in our schools? What's going on in our colleges? What's happening to our families? Why are we so aimless as a nation? What's happening to, to everything in the foundation of this country in particular that made this nation great? Not greater, but great among the nations. What have we forsaken? Especially as we approach Christmas time, I believe many, many people, many people are going to be looking just a moment. God, what are we leaving behind us? What are we evolving into as a society? And if we don't stop this course, what will it look like at the end? I know it offers this euphoric idea of a new order, but is it really euphoric? And is it really new? Is it not, has it not been seen before in the world? Is, are there not lessons of history that tell us that this trajectory is disastrous that we're on? Why can't we learn from history? It's so important now that the church not be silent. Our voices must be heard. It doesn't matter the price. Our voices must be heard now. Because I believe in my heart. We could have one more awakening. By awakening, I mean just people just suddenly, like the prodigal son, they just suddenly come to themselves and say, what am I doing here? I'm in a field eating with pigs and my father has more than enough bread to spare in his house. I'm getting up and I'm going home. And for anybody in this country that's going to hear this message in the days ahead, my word to you is simple. Get up and go home. Get up and go back to God. Get up and go back to prayer. Get up. Get up and read this Bible again. Just get up and go back. Hallelujah. We have a moment of mercy. We have a moment of conscience. We're on the threshold now. I know in my heart that we're going to decide in the next four or five years which way we're going to go. We're going to have a moment of reflection that will either lead us to a place where there'll be healing and restoration and a marvelous shout of praise to God in these last days. Or there will be bitter cries, desires for vengeance, confusion, hopelessness and anger and looking for somebody to blame for the mess. Choose this day. Joshua said, choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will. And we're going to stand in just a moment. My altar call is real simple. As the body of Christ, after hearing this kind of a word, you can only reach two conclusions. I'm in or I'm out. Now, some of you are already in, but some are right in the middle and you're in that valley of decision. You're not sure. You're not sure. Do I really want to pray with passion and power? Do I, do I really want to stand? Do I really want to be a living testimony of who God is for the sake of others, not for myself, but for others? If that's your heart, he will give you what you need. He will become your source of strength and supply. And it's to these people that I speak today. 
It's a hard decision to make. I'm not going to suggest it's easy. Nobody wants to be vilified, lose their freedom, whatever it's going to involve. But the time has come for the church to be the church again. The time has come for you and I to hit the upper room on Tuesday night and say, God Almighty, I give my life for you, for your purposes. You've saved me. Thank you for that. But I yield my life now for your purposes on the earth through me. And yes, you struggle. And yes, you're fearful. We all are. But he can become the source of your strength. He can be every resource. He can be your supply, your direction, your courage. Some that are here this morning, you'll find yourself speaking with courage you never knew you had because you didn't have it. You put it in your heart. You put in that perfect love for people that cast out the fear of their rejection. Oh, God, help us. Oh, God, help us. We are the only hope now for the nation, folks. God, help us to, to heed the call, to stand up, to be counted. And if that's the cry of your heart today, and you can be among those of us who say, I'm, I'm, I've been on the fence in this, but by God's grace, I'm going in. By God's grace, count me in. This is a war for the souls of men, and I am not willing to sit on the sidelines. But I recognize that I will need everything that God has for me. I'll need the armor, the equipment, the training. I can't do this in my own strength. But I'm in. And if that's the cry of your heart today, I want to open the front of this auditorium, the space between the screens and the annex in North Jersey as well at the front of the auditorium. And for those that are listening online, and part of this fellowship. We love you. We thank God for you. You can just stand up in your living room, wherever you are, and say, Pastor, by the grace of God, I'm in. By the grace of God, I will take my stand. I will pray and trust God to be a living witness. If that's the cry of your heart, let's stand together. Just make your way here, and we'll pray together, please. Balcony, go to either exit, the main sanctuary. Just slip out. We're going to worship for 10 minutes, then we're going to pray together. Please don't block the aisles for those that are trying to come down. Just slide out. Take your stand for God today. You say today, what's in this for me? Him. Jesus Christ is what's in this for you today. His passion, His power. His purpose, everything of Christ is yours. In his name, amen. Paul said to Timothy, fight this fight as a good soldier of Christ. And no man that wars and tangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. It doesn't mean you, we don't work. It doesn't mean we don't interrelate. It doesn't mean we don't have bills to pay. It just means that that doesn't become our whole focus. Our focus is on the kingdom of God, the souls of other people. I'm going to ask Andrew, if you will, to just on your trumpet play Amazing Grace. And as he plays it, make the choice in your heart. I know you have already, and many in the sanctuary already have. Like, I'm in, God. I'm in. I'm in. You've saved me. It's now about others. You've saved me. And now give me the strength I need to be all that you've called me to be. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time together. And this is a solemn assembly today. And often in the scriptures, you would call a solemn assembly when there was something profound happening and needed in the nation. This is a solemn assembly this morning. We can't clap our hands and shout hooray as if the, we've already won, for we're just entering into the battle that's ahead of us. But God soberly and righteously help us to make the choices we need to make now and to be able to hear your promises to us. Give us ears of faith to be able to hear the things that you are willing to do through us if we will let you do it. 
Give us courage to go through every door you call us to go through, individually, collectively, Lord. Give us love, Lord, in our voices that will compel others to come into the house of God. Deliver us, Lord, from delusion, from self-seeking. Give us a heart, Lord, that that heart that sent you to a cross for us, give us that same heart that will cause us, Lord, to yield to you for the sake of others. Help us, Lord, to recognize the high calling that you've placed on each of our lives. Help us to fight for our children, Lord. Help us, God. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, Paul here has outlined two frightful things that will strike the church just prior to the Lord's coming. Number one, a great falling away, a great apostasy in the church. Secondly, a spirit of Antichrist possessing many who are in the church. Now, folks, for years we've been preaching and teaching about the coming Antichrist. He's going to come one day and he's going to be well received. And I'll tell you why he's going to be well received. He's going to be well received even by many who were Christians, who have been prepared for his coming. And he's going to be revealed. And the only reason he's not revealed now, it's not his time. And the Holy Ghost is holding it back. But one day the Holy Ghost will lift his restraining hand. This man will be revealed. He'll be incarnated by Satan. He will demand and receive the worship of mankind. And then when his work is finished, his time is done, the Bible said he's going to be consumed with the mouth of our Holy God.